And so Airbus, however, is probably about a $50 billion advantage over it from a debt standpoint. And so they can move ahead and start planning for the next generation and sort of seal this dominance that they're probably going to have of the aircraft business. From war-torn skies to global industry titan, the story of Airbus is one of ambition, controversy, and relentless innovation. Bavarian politician Franz Josef Strauss, obsessed with both planes and power, galvanized Europe to take on the American giants of aviation. As Airbus engineers gambled on game-changing technologies, boardrooms clashed over the company's very soul as fierce competition against Boeing threatened to sink it before it ever took off. Franz Joseph Strauss was no ordinary man. He was born in the heart of Bavaria. Many saw him as a tempestuous cocktail of ambition, controversy, and an undeniable brilliance that would leave its mark upon a continent. Strauss rose from humble butcher's son to become a key architect of post-war Germany. But beyond the machinations of politics burned a different passion, aviation. It wasn't merely the thrill of flight that captivated him. Strauss saw aviation as the embodiment of progress. For him, it was a symbol of European technological might on par with the rising powers of the United States and the Soviet Union. Legend has it that during the construction of Munich Airport, Strauss was so impatient with the progress that he rented a bulldozer and started shaping a runway himself. The mound of earth created became known as Straussburg, or Strauss Mountain. Evidence of his hands-on style and determination to get things done. It was clear from early on that his commitment was total. With Germany's aircraft industry still hobbled by the scars of war, Strauss's attention turned to restoring the country's place in the skies. Meanwhile, across Europe, similar ambitions stirred. In France, designers dreamt of a jet airliner that would shatter limitations of distance and speed. And in Britain, engineers eyed the bleeding edge of aeronautics. It was a fragmented landscape, but ripe with possibility. Strauss's unwavering belief in European unity propelled him into the heart of this nascent industry. He saw Airbus not simply as a commercial project, but as an embodiment of European reunification. He was the architect, the catalyst, the ox, determined to drag a collaborative European Airbus kicking and screaming, if necessary, into the skies. The birth of Airbus was not from a single grand vision. It emerged from a complex web of motivations, both technological and political, that simmered on both sides of the Rhine River. In the early 1960s, both France and Germany possessed the fragments of a world-class aerospace industry. They had designers with ambition, engineers with leftover war-forged skills, and the burning desire to reclaim their place in the skies. But resources were limited, and neither nation could go it alone. Airbus was the perfect embodiment of this unity, a tangible project merging engineering prowess with a political purpose. Yet, forging this binational engine was fraught with challenges. National pride clashed with the need for compromise. Engineers from different backgrounds locked horns on design philosophies. Political winds shifted, threatening to ground the entire project before it took off. The sheer audacity of the endeavor was mind-boggling at the time. They wanted to create a wide-body airliner with two engines at a time when long-haul flights were dominated by three- and four-engine giants. The very idea of the A300 was a gamble, convincing airlines that a twin-engine aircraft could safely cross oceans was an uphill battle. 
but Airbus engineers led by the visionary Roger Batil believed in their calculations and the potential of advanced new engines from the likes of General Electric. The A300's wide-body design revolutionized passenger comfort. Airlines could fit hundreds of passengers and increase profitability on those sought-after routes linking major cities. Its shorter, wider fuselage also presented a unique engineering challenge. How would they load and unload cargo efficiently? How could they streamline turnaround times at airports? Ground infrastructure would need as much innovation as the aircraft itself. The A300 was much more than a larger version of existing aircraft. It embodied a new philosophy of design. The design pioneered the use of lightweight composite materials to reduce fuel consumption. Decisions about cockpit layout and the number of crew members required would influence how commercial aircraft were piloted for decades to come. Bringing the A300 to life was a monumental jigsaw puzzle, but the image of its enormous fuselage being transported on roads was a spectacle that drew crowds in the quiet towns along the way. The A300's revolutionary design and European pedigree were one thing, but convincing airlines to place their trust and millions of dollars in this newcomer was quite another. The 1970s aviation market was dominated by the American giants, Boeing with its venerable 747 and McDonnell Douglas with its DC-10 Trijet. These were proven aircraft, backed by established networks of support and spare parts. Airbus faced the classic innovator's dilemma. The a300 was more fuel efficient, more spacious for passengers, and potentially cheaper to operate. But airlines are notoriously cautious, especially when the consequences of equipment failure are so severe. Airbus was a gamble, an untested entity up against industry titans. The first few years were lean. The order book was bolstered primarily by European airlines, partly due to government pressure. Breaking into lucrative markets like those in the United States proved an uphill battle. Airbus became adept at the art of the lease, offering tempting short-term deals to let hesitant airlines try the A300 in action. Strauss wasn't afraid to leverage his political influence to secure early orders for Airbus planes, especially from the state-owned German airline Lufthansa. This was a controversial tactic, but demonstrates his relentless drive to get Airbus off the ground. The marketing push painted the A300 as the embodiment of the future. It was pitched to airlines as a technological leap forward, a way to attract passengers with its wider seats and quieter cabin. Yet Airbus was still a fledgling company compared to the Americans. The infrastructure and the global support system simply didn't match what customers were used to. It would take time and demonstrable success to break down these barriers of doubt. In the meantime, Airbus wasn't content to rest on its laurels. Even as the A300 slowly gained traction, the company was restless to innovate. The goal was to build a family of aircraft to fill every niche in the market, and to continually break new technological ground in the process. The A310 was a shortened derivative of the A300. It arrived in the early 1980s. This airplane offered airlines the same advanced technology, but in a smaller package, optimized for medium to long-range routes. This strategic move opened new markets, proving Airbus could cater to diverse needs. But perhaps even more revolutionary was Airbus's bold embrace of fly-by-wire technology with the A320 program. In traditional aircrafts, Pilot commands are transmitted to control surfaces through a complex system of hydraulics and cables. FBW replaces this with electronic signals. This results in lighter aircraft and potentially safer flight operations. It was a risky leap, particularly in a safety-obsessed industry. When the A320 entered service with Air France in 1988, it was the first commercial airliner with fly-by-wire controls. Some pilots were initially hesitant about this new technology, but the A320 proved the system was both safe and enhanced flight efficiency. This plane would not only redefine aviation, it would redefine Airbus itself. For decades, US aerospace giant Boeing had enjoyed near dominance of the market for large civilian aircraft. 
That began to change with the rise of Airbus. The A340 earned its stripes by conducting some of the longest non-stop commercial flights at a time. A Singapore Airlines A340 flew an astonishing 15,344 kilometers from Singapore to Newark, demonstrating its long-haul capabilities. What was once a comfortable status quo transformed into a relentless struggle for both technological innovation and market share. With Airbus proving its mettle via the A310 and A300, Boeing was forced to react. The 757 and 767 were direct responses to the European challenge. The aviation world, once so predictable, suddenly became a whirlwind of back-and-forth one-upmanship. Airbus's introduction of fly-by-wire in the A320 forced Boeing to rethink its approach and eventually develop a rival system for its own upgraded jets. This race wasn't just happening in design studios. Through shrewd marketing and aggressive sales campaigns, Airbus began chipping away at Boeing's traditional strongholds. Carriers long seen as loyal Boeing customers started experimenting with the European upstart. Air travel was the true beneficiary of this rivalry. Airlines had more choices, and this spurred a relentless drive to offer passengers safer, more comfortable, and more technologically advanced aircraft. The Airbus-Boeing rivalry didn't simply change the industry landscape. It fueled decades of extraordinary progress that pushed the limits of what was possible in commercial aviation. By the early 2000s, Airbus had established itself as a true titan. It finally stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Boeing, but its ambitions weren't sated. The company embarked on its most audacious project yet, the A380. This double-decker behemoth promised to ferry over 500 passengers in unparalleled comfort, and in the process, transform the economics of long-haul travel. The A380 represented a fundamental belief in the future of the hub-and-spoke model of air travel. Airbus predicted that air traffic would continue to surge, and that existing airports and routes would soon be crowded. Massive airliners like the A380 ferrying vast loads of passengers through major hubs were seen as the answer. Developing the Super Jumbo was a staggering undertaking. Airbus pushed aeronautical design to its limits yet again. Advanced materials were required to keep the weight in check. Systems of such complexity demanded an entire rethinking of how an aircraft was wired and powered. The A380 was conceived as the pinnacle of air travel, yet the very concept was a gamble of unprecedented scale. The development costs skyrocketed. Each A380 was effectively a custom-built masterpiece that pushed production facilities to their outer limits. The project was fraught with delays, with complex wiring problems plaguing the early stages. Lurking beneath the technological audacity was a more fundamental question. Was the market truly changing? Some analysts argued that point-to-point -point travel with smaller, more efficient aircraft directly connecting cities threatened the hub-and-spoke model. With this information in mind, the economics of the A380 began to crumble. Airlines had their own balance sheets in mind, and they started to get cold feet. The industry was beginning to wonder if Airbus was building a white elephant fit for a bygone era. By this time, Airbus was well established in the commercial arena, but the company wasn't content to rest on its civilian success. It needed a slice of the lucrative military aviation market to challenge the dominance of American giants like Lockheed Martin. The A400M Atlas turboprop transport aircraft became the vehicle for this ambition. But as Airbus would soon discover, the world of military contracts was a stark contrast to the commercial airline business. The A400M was initially envisioned as a collaborative European project to replace aging transport aircraft like the C-130 Hercules. It promised the ability to haul massive cargo, operate from short or rough airstrips, and support diverse military needs. Political wrangling quickly ensnared the project. 
Nations had their own agendas, their specific requirements varied, and their own domestic industries had to be appeased. Technical challenges followed, the development budget ballooned, and timelines became nebulous. Yet, Airbus was determined. Despite their disagreements, European nations recognized the need to bolster their own military capabilities independently from reliance on the United States. The A400M became a symbol of this strategic ambition, even as its cost and complexity grew. Weathering Storms Airbus reached for the stratosphere with the A380 and the A400M, but they would soon encounter harsh turbulence. The A380's production woes became a public embarrassment. Airlines grew impatient. Orders once seen as certain started to dwindle. The financial impact was severe. Airbus was flush with success from A320 family sales, but the company now saw its profitability slashed by the super jumbo delays and cost overruns. Internally, Airbus also faced turmoil. National rivalries flared as countries blamed each other for mounting costs. Leadership changes became frequent. Plans were overhauled. A series of painful restructuring programs aimed to streamline operations. These weren't mere setbacks. They were an existential threat to Airbus's future. The A380 was in danger of becoming a costly failure that would tarnish the hard-earned Airbus reputation. The missteps cast doubt on the company's ability to manage ambitious projects. The mantra of European cooperation, once a bedrock of the company, began to show cracks. But Airbus weathered the storm. The A380 never reached the sales success envisioned. It was finally completed and entered service, showcasing its technological marvels. Production problems were ironed out, painful lessons were learned about risk management and the need for ruthless efficiency to survive the volatile aerospace market. Airbus emerged leaner, perhaps a bit bruised, but also wiser and more determined to not let ambition outpace capability. Franz Joseph Strauss passed away in 1988, with hope in his heart that one day this aerospace conglomerate would surpass its American rival, at least in Europe. In 2019, his dream came true when Airbus became the world's largest manufacturer of airlines, as well as the leading helicopter manufacturer. In the same year, the company generated a revenue of $54.7 billion. As expected, the profits decreased during the COVID-19 pandemic, but a revenue of $47.7 billion in 2023 showed that the company is still going strong. Today, Airbus boasts a diverse portfolio of aircraft catering to virtually every segment of the market. The A320 family remains the workhorse. These models are famed for their efficiency and prove popular with airlines worldwide. The long-range A330 and ultra-long-range A350 XWB offer wide-body capability with cutting-edge technology. Though production of the A380 ceased in 2021, the double-decker giant continues to operate for select airlines. Production facilities span Europe. Key assembly lines exist in Toulouse, France, Hamburg, Germany, but also Tianjin, China, and Mobile USA. Globalization is evident, with components sourced from a worldwide network of suppliers. Beyond the commercial realm, the A400M Atlas has found its footing as a tactical workhorse for several European air forces, and Airbus's ventures in helicopters, space technologies, and defense systems have solidified its identity as a multifaceted aerospace powerhouse. Airbus understands that past success is no guarantee in a rapidly evolving industry. The quest for sustainable aviation fuels the drive for current and future technological projects across the company. Green aviation is top of the agenda. Airbus is actively leading the charge for the development and utilization of sustainable aviation fuels. These fuels are derived from sources like used cooking oil or agricultural waste and offer a significant reduction in carbon emissions compared to traditional jet fuel. Looking further into the future, Airbus is investing heavily in the pursuit of zero-emission aircraft. The Zero-E project explores three radical concepts, a turbofan design fueled by liquid hydrogen, a turboprop design for shorter routes, and a futuristic blended wing-body concept for unparalleled efficiency. 
These bold visions could reshape air travel as we know it. Partnerships are still a key. Airbus collaborates with universities, research institutes, and even rival aerospace companies to tackle challenges like hydrogen storage and infrastructure needs. The company recognizes that the push for a cleaner future of flight is a shared endeavor, requiring a shift across the entire aviation ecosystem. The story of Airbus is one born from the ashes of World War II and fueled by a vision of a European united through something extraordinary and ambitious. Franz Josef Strauss, a political force of nature, embodied that desire with unmatched tenacity. His bullish determination to put Europe on an equal aerospace footing with the United States and the Soviet Union was both visionary and essential for Airbus to ever take flight. Decades later, Airbus undeniably stands as a symbol of European cooperation. Engineers from across the continent, sometimes rivals, more often collaborators, have forged a company that defines world-class innovation. Airplanes with names like A330 or A350 still carry passengers across the globe, with each takeoff a silent testament to the idea that Europe can compete and win on the grandest of technological stages.